Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day. See General Hospital's Ava for the fans' new video. Please go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Only the truly stout of heart would dare to get mixed up with Ava Jerome. When the General Hospital femme fatal gives a kiss, it's often the kiss of death. Just ask Silas, Morgan, Nicholas, at least temporarily, or now Austin. Yet, the inimitable Mora West's alter ego is still perfectly poised for a new entanglement. Frankly, she always is, being as red-hot as her martinis are ice-cold. But who would risk his neck to give her his heart? Option no. One is Nicholas. We know. We know. You'd think there would be no coming back from his attempted kidnapping of Avery and the girl's mom killing him. But this is Port Charles where Ava now peacefully resides with Babby Daddy Sonny, whose old flame she snuffed out. Anything can happen here. Plus, Nicholas has admitted that he regrets the way things went down with his ex. And heaven, hell, knows he's sorry for ever hooking up with son Spencer's then-girlfriend Esmond behind his wife's back. These two may be past the point of giving it the old college try once again, but are still contenders to give it the old. Um grad school tried. Another possibility is Finn. Sure, he's finally sort of settled into a rhythm with Elizabeth. But that makes it the perfect time to shake up that couple. Fans didn't necessarily thrill to the past obstacles put in hospital staffer's path. Her pregnancy by Nicholas and a WTH recollection of killing his first wife. Ava, though. Dropping her into the mix would be like plunking an olive in a martini. Perfection. Imagine if Finn took pity on Ava as all eyes looked her way in the investigation into Austin's murder. Imagine if his support of her led to an accidental kiss. Would Liz write it off as happenstance? Ava's fault. Or would she decide that if she really wants Finn, she's going to have to fight for him? Dirty if need be. Finally, General Hospital could give Ava the love interest we've been dying for her to get for years. Scotty. Everyone knows that West and Kin Triner. Friends since their days on, as the world turns together. Throw sparks like they were a two-person fireworks show. And Scotty has always had a soft spot for Ava. Perhaps, were the prime suspect in Austin's murder to be hauled into court, Scotty could not only defend her, but provide an alibi. She couldn't have killed him, your honor, because the defendant was with me, in bed. Then, They'd have to go through the motions of pretending to be a couple just long enough for Ava to realize that she should have been with Scott all along. Newer daytime viewers may not realize it, but there was a time, a long time, in fact, when soaps not only entertained but informed their audiences. We still got our love triangles and catfights and evil twins and all that, but we also got stories that opened minds as well as broke hearts. Back then, there were a lot more shows on the air, and none of them were as afraid of alienating even a few fans as the four remaining ones are now. So the genre's trailblazers dealt frankly with topics that today would scare the bejesus out of the powers that be. Agnes Nixon had all my children's Erika Kane exercise her right to have an abortion and awakened one life to lives Carla Gray to the fact that black lives matter. William J. Bell gave the young and the restless Catherine Chancellor a girlfriend. Claire Levine and Paul Avila Mayer used religious differences as an insurmountable obstacle in the romance of Ryan's hopes Patrick Ryan and Nancy Feldman. And at General Hospital, Levine gave a face to the AIDS epidemic, that of Stone Cates. By the time he was diagnosed as being HIV positive, the audience was already enamored of Michael Sutton's character, the ward of local mafioso Sonny Corinto's and first boyfriend of Robin Scorpio. We'd watched Kimberly McCullough's teenage alter ego grow up on screen, so it was a big, big deal that we approved of Stone for her. Heck, we liked the coupling so much that we were always rooting for the kids to overcome the objections of her Uncle Mac to be together. At first, the youngsters had practiced safe sex, but since he had attested negative for HIV, they threw caution to the wind a decision they'd both come to regret more than words could say. When Stone came down with the flu, he got retested, 
and learned that he was HIV positive. How could he possibly tell Robin? I put you in danger, he wept. You can watch the full steam below. From that point on, Stone's condition worsened with a speed that underscored the cruelty and relentlessness of the disease. As it progressed from HIV to full-blown AIDS, and Robin found out that she, too, was infected. The patient was given his options by doctors Alan Hordermain and Tony Jones. You can watch below. But each course of treatment seemed worse than the last, and neither was guaranteed to extend Stone's life, much less make it one that he'd feel was worth living. In the end, Stone elected to spend his final days at Sonny's penthouse. There was nothing to be done by then but love him. He couldn't even take comfort in the sight of Robin. AIDS had intensified the effects of Stone's CMV retinitis and stripped him of his vision. At least he could feel Robin's hand in his and hear her voice as soft as a caress. I'll go get you something to eat, okay? She said on November 29, 1995. Don't leave me, he replied, his face ashen, his words barely a whisper. Go stand by the window in the light. Robin did as Stone asked, and slowly, little by little, she began to come into focus for him. He was so shocked that he gasped. Audibly gasped. I see you, he cried in disbelief. Oh, Robin, I see you. Alas, her face would be the last thing that he would see in his short life. Tears streaming down her face, Robin climbed into the bed where Stone lay, wrapped herself in his arms, and wept. He was gone. When Sonny came in, Robin's expression told him all that he needed to know. But what could he do with it? He paced as if he needed something to punch. He was a fixer. What the hell could he do with his pain that he couldn't take away, not from Robin or himself? What could he do for Stone? Nothing. Sonny couldn't take it. Later, when the Don was left alone with the boy that he loved like a son, he'd held Stone's hand and allowed the anguish to eat him from the inside out. It tore through him like a razor blade, one that he couldn't be sure he ever stopped feeling. Meanwhile, Mac called Luke Spencer for his niece. Luke knew. The minute Mac said that Robin wanted to speak with him, he knew what had happened. Thank you for being so good to Stone, Robin told him. It was an honor. Love, replied Luke. Robin's dad used to call her that, she remembered. She could only wish that he was there with her now. Finally, as Stone's loved ones gathered at his deathbed, Robin mustered up the strength to tell them, It's gonna be Oak. How? asked Sonny. I don't know yet, she admitted. But we have to make it like that. It's what he'd want. Robin was right. It was okay. Eventually. Not right, not the way that it should have been, but oak. New drug therapies have allowed her to live a far longer and healthier life than Stone did. She was even able to marry and raise a family with fellow doctor Patrick Drake. That's them with daughter Emma above. But neither she nor Sonny ever forgot Stone. Neither did we. And when we think of him, and feel all over again the ache of his passing, we hope against hope that our shows will become braver in their storytelling, so that plots like Mike Corbin's losing battle with Alzheimer's disease become less remarkable for their rarity than for their exceptional quality. In the meantime, a quarter of a century after Stone's passing, McCullough took to social media, saying that 25 years ago today, I experienced what would become my finest moment as an actor. My character lost her first love to AIDS. The love that poured through us that day was a reflection of the best of us, when we can see through the prejudice and the fear of a disease and treat the person experiencing deterioration with compassion, she continued. Telling stories can be a vehicle for enlightenment, and yes, even soap operas can change the world. I believe we did that with the story of Robin and Stone. In 2021, McCullough sat down with Morris Bernard, Sonny, to further discuss the significance of the storyline. This was the first heterosexual couple ever in any medium to deal with AIDS. She noted during an episode of his State of Mind podcast, which you can watch below. And we didn't harp on the fact of, well, how did he get it? 
If he was using drugs, he must be a loser. That wasn't the story, she added. The story was, this is what you're dealing with now. This is who you are as a person now. You're a great person. I'm falling in love with you. We are going through this together. I loved that non-judgmental, educational part about it. Soon, McCullough could tell that the storyline was affecting viewers. People would come up to me all the time and say, My brother's gay, and my mom wouldn't talk to him until this happened on the show, she related. And it's not like we were doing a gay storyline, but it was like some people had to see Robin, who they had watched grow up. They had to see her go through it for them to realize that, oh, this can happen to anyone. It's not because my son's gay, and that means he's bad. It was able to break through in such a lovely way. Lightning is notoriously difficult to catch, much less in a bottle. But boy, when it happens, it's nothing short of electric. So we have to give credit where it's due to General Hospital for the feat that it's pulled off. Heaven knows we take the show, and all the shows, to task when we don't like something. The ABC soap has made Cody and Sasha the root for couple. If you had told us when Cody made his splashy entrance and immediately started irritating viewers and the residents of Port Charles alike that we'd one day be hoping that he sweeps Sasha off her feet, we'd have told you that you were crazy. But now, now we'd have to say instead that you were prescient, because not only are we hoping that he gets the girl, we're shipping the couple big time. General Hospital did everything right with the twosome. After all that Sasha had been through, losing her husband and baby, the writers started her and Cody out at a snail's pace with a sweet friendship that allowed the audience to see him a new, less obnoxious light. Then, when Gladys took a wrecking ball to her daughter-in-law's fragile existence, the powers that behead Cody ride to the rescue. Obviously, having been traumatized for the better part of two years, Sasha is in no emotional shape to jump into anything. And that's fine with Cody. He's not looking for guarantees, only a chance. And it's such lovely writing. Those are such tender performances by Josh Kelly and Sophia Matson. How could you not cheer on Cody and Sasha and wait with bated breath for their first kiss? General Hospital's Laura and Valentin might think they've got a good sense of Charlotte's issues, now that her brainwashing via dead grandpa Victor has all come to light. But that couldn't be further from the truth. Cause the flames of little Miss Cassidine's fury are still burning, and whoever really set fire to Anna's house is still out there. Viewers and characters on screen alike cried foul when Anna tried to question a hospitalized Charlotte and sent the traumatized girl into hysterics. Why would you think that's a good idea, Anna? Between that and the bullet she took, it's no wonder Charlotte's still holding a grudge. Fessing up all of her misdeeds, or at least some misdeeds, to her darling papa upon being sprung from G.H. doesn't mean a thing, per her portrayer Scarlett Fernandez. I don't think she really feels bad for going after Anna, or even feels like she betrayed him. Fernandez tells SoPaparatagist.com of Charlotte and Valentin's big Thanksgiving showdown. I think she is just still so convinced that Anna is really out to get her and out to get Valentin that she is still on a mission. She still feels like she needs to get Anna. The problem with that? Charlotte's insistence to both Nina and Val that she didn't set the fire just hammers and that someone else is out to get Anna too. And the longer Charlotte is under suspicion, and all the blame is falling on Victor's tarot card terrorizing, the bigger the odds that Anna's real stalker will land everyone in danger. There's already one tally on the body count. Anna's top suspect, WSB agent Jameson Forsyth, who got turned into a hood ornament and ended up on a PCPD morgue slab. Obviously, somebody wanted to keep Forsyth quiet and silencing Anna is next on the to-do list. With Charlotte still out to get Anna herself, sounds to us like she and the arsonist are about to be gasoline and a match, blowing this whole story sky high. When General Hospital killed off Austin, in so doing letting go Roger Howarth, we didn't believe it at first. The soap clearly knows that the Emmy-winning alum of loving, one life to live, and as the world turns is an MVP and a half. 
It wouldn't have given him one character after another to play if it hadn't been aware and appreciative of his talent and popularity. But when the actor spoke out about what had gone down behind the scenes, expressing his gratitude for his decade-plus run, we finally started to wrap our brains around the fact that he really was gone. Not forever, mind you. Howarth is sure to score a new soap role in less time than it will take you to read this article. I'm an actor. I love acting, the soap vet said when asked by Soap Opera Digest whether he was open to doing another daytime drama. He's 100% into the idea. If somebody's gonna ask me, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna get in the car. The question is, which show will snap up the fan favorite first? Since he's never appeared on The Young and the Restless, The Bold and The Beautiful or Days of Our Lives, he couldn't reprise a role on any of those serials. But he could certainly rock a recast, as he did on both, as the world turns, and General Hospital. The Bold and the Beautiful could tap the actor to play Blake Hayes, the unstable ex-husband of Taylor, for whom Steffi's son is bizarrely named. Peter Brown, who originated the role, passed away in 2016. But there's still a lot of story to be told with the character, especially if he came back to Los Angeles proclaiming to be a changed man. If Taylor bought it, would her waffling former spouse Ridge get all territorial and protective, in such a way that it made trouble in paradise with his favorite missus, Brooke? On the young and the restless, Howarth could give the Newmans and the Abbots a run for their vast quantities of money by reintroducing the Prentice family, starting with Brooks. Aka, the son of bold and beautiful star John McCook's Lance Prentice and Leslie Brooks. The character hasn't been on the show since he was a kid, so he could have grown up to be a real mover and shaker like his dad. And Brooks would be a great romantic interest for Phyllis. We already know that Howarth and Michelle Stafford have chemistry galore thanks to their general hospital pairing as Franco and Nina. At Days of Our Lives, Howarth could, and we'd argue, should, play an altogether new character. Let the actor, who's so great at fleshing out his parts, invent someone from scratch, drop him in Salem, and turn him loose on the dating scene. Allow the character to have some fun with the fact that everyone in town just goes around breaking up and making up with their exes in a never-ending cycle. Have him swear off the Nichols and Sarahs of Salem to try his luck on a matchmaking app and wind up being paired with, of all people, Kristen. And hey, there's no saying that just because Howarth is done as Austin on General Hospital, he's done at General Hospital. Now that, sadly, the streaming version of One Life to Live is defunct, he could always bring Todd Manning back to Port Charles. Not only did his Landview counterpart throw eye-popping sparks with Carly, his on-again-slash-off-again soulmate Blair Kramer now has ties to Port Charles, owing to ex-husband Martin Gray.